Hope everybody had a good weekend. Today we're going to, um, this is our only uh, PowerPoint lecture this week. The rest of the week we're going to be working on our final projects using class time, but today we're going to um, do a lecture on development and dredging. So the learning or the um, topics today are impacts of coastal development, the uses for and consequences of dredging, and water management and impacts to the ecosystem. We just have a short lecture today, and then um, I have two articles that I want you to read for um, for activities today. Today you'll learn that rivers that feed the coast are essential sources of freshwater for humans, and in many places demand exceeds supply. You'll learn that coastal developments typically don't provide the same habitat values and water quality benefits as salt marshes and mangroves. You'll learn that typically coastal property is built on top of a sand dune, resulting in the loss of connection between the dune and the beach and leading to coastal erosion. It's so important to consider humans' impacts on the coast when we're talking about coastal oceanography because a lot of us live near the coast. So presently, about 40% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast. And as population density and economic activity in the coastal zone increases, you can have pressures on coastal ecosystems. So you don't have to necessarily live on the beach to be um, producing pressures on these coastal ecosystems. As we'll see, sometimes living in a watershed is enough to cause some severe impacts to um, the coastal environment. And I will show you an example of that as we move on in today's lecture. The rivers that feed the coast are essential sources of fresh water for humans. And in many places, demand exceeds supply. And so we can't ignore that these um, rivers are really an essential resource for us as people. Around two-thirds of the global population, and that's four billion people, face water scarcity for at least one month a year. In the U.S., as many as 96 out of 204 major freshwater basins that were surveyed are at risk of or currently experiencing a water shortage. And so water shortage is a problem even in this country, but certainly a problem throughout the world. One, one great example, probably like the textbook case um, for the United States, would be the Colorado River. This river provides water to 40 million Americans, and there's not enough water to go around. It's already experiencing shortages that are leading to reservoirs um, being depleted of water. You can see a picture here of um, Utah's Lake Powell, which is one of co the Colorado River's reservoirs. And there's a 70 foot, uh, essentially bathtub ring around the outside of it where the water levels have declined in recent years. Today, we'll think about some ways that coastal development puts pressure on coastal ecosystems. So that's the goal for today's lecture. So as you read in the book by Jack Davis, in the 1960s especially, people flocked to buy property along the Gulf Coast because it was cheap waterfront property. So these are people that were living in, um, in the Northeast and uh, property was becoming really expensive and hard to get in the Northeast, especially waterfront property. And so the Gulf Coast was largely undeveloped and it was a great place for people to have that beachfront if they wanted it. And so to keep up with demand for waterfront property, you learn that developers created more waterfront property by building artificial canals. And so they essentially took away all of the mangroves and the salt marsh that would normally exist by the coast. And they built up a system of finger canals that led to nowhere so people could have, um, have waterfront property. The seawalls that line those canals don't provide the same habitat values and water quality benefits as salt marshes and mangroves. They really don't do anything that salt marshes and mangroves do. And then there's a problem because the canals didn't go anywhere, so there really wasn't any sort of flow. They all had dead ends, um, and so they had poor water quality from a lack of water flow. 
And so some solutions that people have come up with in um, places like Florida to deal with these these problems that we've inherited essentially from 1960s developers are to um, a couple of things. So we can build artificial reefs under docks to supply habitat for fish and invertebrates. This is a picture of one from a major pro program that's been um, completed or, or um, is underway in Marco Island where people are installing these mini reefs underneath their docks. They're not using that space anyways. And the people swear that um, fish like snapper have come back to the canals after they've installed these things. The lack of water connectivity is harder to deal with. So you can restore connectivity to the finger canals by um, digging culverts for the water to pass through. And so that way water doesn't dead end at the end of these canals. Um, but people are also spending a lot of money to install pumps that will circulate the water at the dead ends. And so they're creating their own circulation in these canals. Obviously not the best, um, obviously not the best scenario for someone wanting waterfront property, essentially having in your backyard this stinky kind of stagnant canal where you can't fish and you can't swim and it doesn't really go anywhere. <laughs> so. So people don't usually develop like this anymore. But we've inherited these coastal forms from the 1960s developers. I mean, they're not going anywhere. The way that um, developers in the 1960s did this was through um, what we call dredge and fill. And so dredging is just excavating sediments from the bottom of a water body. And when you're doing dredge and fill, you take those sediments and you are replacing aquatic habitat with dry land. So you're taking sand out from underneath the water and moving it up on shore to get rid of that intertidal zone and build out the land. And this creates more land that you can sell to people who want to live near the coast. Obviously not the best um, way to use dredging as we've seen how this has played out over time, but dredging isn't always bad. A lot of dredging operations are necessary for humans to use the coast as we do. Um, and it's not necessarily a harmful process always. So dredging, for instance, can be used to keep um, rivers and canals open for shipping traffic. And it's a routine necessity in waterways around the world because these waterways just through the natural river processes, they'll fill with sediments. And so in order to keep them open for shipping um, and in reliable locations where ships can travel, um, they need to be dredged. Oftentimes these sediments aren't moved far away. They're just moved close by um, onto, onto some shoals. And uh, usually these projects don't have any long-term consequences. They're certainly better than channelizing the entire river with um, cement. If we need ships to pass through, then um, dredging is less environmental dam environmentally damaging than just making the entire river channel um, unmovable and filled with cement. Dredging is also performed to clean up the environment after a, um, after a pollutant has, in has entered the sediments. It can be performed to reduce the exposure of fish, wildlife, and people to contaminants. And that dredge material is taken out of the lake or stream or um, coastal environment and stored and um, removed from the environment and um, disposed of. And then as we learned uh, um, for beach replenishment projects, you need to have sand moved from um, some offshore environment up onto land to um, to replenish the beach after it's been eroded away. And so sand can be collected from an offshore location by a dredge and then piped up onto the beach. So dredging is used for a lot of different things, not just dredge and fill projects. However, you will notice that all of these all of these uses are either for human uses or to um, kind of uh, clean up after some sort of human mistake, like a uh, pollution spill. So 
So there is a, um, another kind of interesting use of dredging that's come about from conflict in the South China Sea. So um, I'm going to go ahead and point you to Top Hat to complete this assignment. I'll give you guys about, eh, we'll give you 10 minutes. You'll probably need a little, little longer because there's actually two articles in this assignment talking about conflict between China and Taiwan and how China is using dredging as a weapon in its um, low-key war against Taiwan. So let me know if you have any trouble with this. Maybe not? Okay. So, um, you saw a really interesting example. Hold on a second. Guest lecturer is here. I know, I know. Okay. That was a really interesting example, I think, of how dredging can be used. So add, um, as a weapon to the list of how dredging can be used. I see these things in the news and I have no one to share them with. I'm so glad that I have you all to share all these weird, weird kind of consequences of today's um, coastal use <laughs> with you all. So anyways, we, we don't really know why China is doing this, but um, the best guess is that control of the waters around the islands through the use of an exclusive economic zone will help China control transportation and trade through that region if they ever need to. And so they're trying to exert more control over um, Taiwan and put pressure on some of the surrounding nations. And if using their dredges in Taiwanese waters um, serves an additional benefit to them of exhausting Taiwanese resources, then, um, you know, all the better for China. So it's kind of a... Um, an interesting example of of aggression um, by China. You'll also hear in the news occasionally about how um, U.S. forces will move you know, too close to one of these artificial islands because the U.S. doesn't recognize um, China's uh, essentially owning the surrounding water. Um, these, Since these are man-made islands, it's kind of unclear as to whether or not China can claim um, an exclusive economic zone, zone around them. So every so often the U.S. will kind of test the limits and move kind of close to one of these artificial islands. And you'll hear about the conflict um, in the news on NPR and Reuters especially. So now you kind of know where that information is coming from. It's just a disputed region in the South China Sea and a couple of nations, especially China, trying to test the boundaries of, of what they can do. All right, so we're talking, we were talking about dredging, all the different uses of dredging, but let's spend a little bit more time talking about what happens when people are building on shore. Um, so we've learned about the beach, We've learned about um, sand and how, how it moves back and forth across the beach. And I think by now um, you should know that sand dunes are really important. They play a vital role in protecting our beaches, our coastline, our, our developments, our infrastructure from storms. But they also um, provide a really important essentially storage of sand. And so you learned about how sand is um, washed up onto the onto the beach and eventually it can be transported by the winds up a dune. And once it's on the backside of the dune, um, the winds can no longer really um, disturb it. And so it can be it can be stored there until the next, for instance, storm storm event is able to reach those dunes and wash that sand out to sea. Um, However, those storm events are also a major source of erosion for the beach. And so they take sand from the beach and they replenish that sand with, um, with dune sand. So these dunes are a really important future supply of sand for the beach when it experiences some sort of storm activity. They're also a very important environment for many coastal plants and animals. There are some species of plants that you will only find on sand dunes in certain areas of the world. Because they're such an integral part of the beach, 
Um, and because sand is traded between the dune and the beach over and over again through time, that means that when we do things like build coastal property on top of the beach or um, build seawalls to keep that, that dune sand where it is, that we're breaking the connection between the dune and the beach. So essentially we're cutting the beach in half and by severing it, the supply of sand, what that results in is eventually um, the beach sand is just eroded away. And so um, this scene has played out many, many, many times in many coastal developments. You build a seawall, you have a beach in front of it for a few years, and then eventually the water just laps at the seawall. And that's because you're removing that connection between the dune and the beach and no longer allowing sand to flow naturally between the two. So as a result of um, human developments near the coast, we have to pay a special, uh, special attention to coastal erosion. And coastal erosion is, the, is certainly the result of human activities in the coastal area, but it's also a result of natural changes in our world, um, especially sea level rise. And when I'm talking about coastal erosion, the definition is here, the loss or displacement of land or the long-term removal of sediment and rocks along the coastline. It can be due to the action of waves, currents, tides, wind, or ice. Long-term loss of sediments um, in the coastal zone results in shoreline retreat, which is um, essentially the, the retreat of the shoreline that we see as, as available for development. This picture here is a fantastic example of shoreline retreat um, along the Yorkshire co coast in Great Britain where um, entire portions of the coastal, the area that's been developed um, along the coast are just falling off this cliff into, into the ocean, essentially. Um, so that obviously creates a huge problem for these communities near, near this cliff. Coastal erosion is a very common thing that people near the coast have to deal with. About 70% of the sandy coast around the world is eroding. Um, and that is, of course, because the sea level is rising. So we will talk more about climate change. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a process that's occurring all over the world. It's a global change because it's caused by a, a global problem, sea level rise. And because of this, humans are forced to move inland, which squeezes the living space for humans. It also destroys beach biodiversity because instead of a beautiful beach with with dunes, now you get essentially a cliff face, um, not a whole lot of habitat along this cliff face for organisms to live, and that just leads out essentially to um, open water. In this case, the tide has receded quite a bit, so you can see there's a little bit of sand, but that's just temporary. So to respond to coastal erosion, what we typically do is armor the shoreline. Um, shoreline armoring is the practice of using physical structures to protect shorelines from coastal erosion. We talked a little bit about this when we talked about um, living shorelines, which are an example where you can use, um, for instance, marsh or mangrove or oyster um, to do some of the shoreline armoring for you. But um, most cases we're using construction materials. So this is um, an attempt by coastal managers, maybe managers of a city or individual property owners to stabilize their land and protect residential and commercial property along the coast. And they're building structures to hold back the force, the full force of the sea and to um, stabilize that sediment and prevent further loss of sediment. And there are three common types of structures that are built for shoreline armoring. You can have a breakwater, which is a barrier that's built offshore, like this one here, um, to protect a coast or harbor from the force of the waves. So you typically find these around coasts and harbors. And these are something that would take, for instance, a city budget or a regional budget to create. If you're a coastal landowner, like a residential landowner, then there are a couple of different structures that you could build. You could build a seawall, also known as a bulkhead, which is a vertical or near vertical wall um, designed to prevent upland erosion and storm surge flooding. 
These are oftentimes made out of metal. Sometimes they can be made out of wood or concrete, but it's just essentially a seawall, just a vertical, vertical wall face. Perhaps a step in the right direction, you could build something like riprap, which is human placed rock or other material that can be used to protect the shoreline structures against erosion. It absorbs a lot of the um, wave impacts and the presence of these rocks can weigh down the sediment and prevent it from eroding out into the water. Um, it's slightly better than a bulkhead because you still have some locations that um, hard structures that organisms can grow on and little nooks and crannies in, in amongst those rocks where organisms can still live. But it's certainly no wetland. <laughs> So if you're replacing wetland with riprap, that's definitely a downgrade. If you're replacing bulkhead with, or a seawall with riprap, that's probably an upgrade. All right, let's go ahead and do a quiz. Talked about a lot of different uses for dredging today. Which of the following are some uses for dredging? More than one answer may be correct. Please choose all of the correct answers. I was afraid that if I put it on there, people might actually pick it. <laughs> and it's a quiz, so I want you guys to get your points. Okay. Maybe for the test, I'll put it on there. Okay, so um, three of these are correct. So dredging is used to open up waterways that have experienced sedimentation. Um, it's performed to reduce the exposure to contaminants. If you're going to remove those contaminants, you can do so by dredging. It can be collected from an offshore location by a dredge and piped um, sand can be and onto the beach for beach replenishment. Um, so those three are correct. Um, dredging is actually not used to sample deep sea rocks. Um, that is coring. So you might be confusing dredging with coring. Dredging is... Um, cutting up and removing sediment from the seafloor. Coring is taking a small sample of the seafloor for scientific purposes. Come on. Apparently, I coded that wrong, so I'll make sure you guys get credit for it, because I know that more than 0% of you answered this correctly. Oops. <laughs> it's fine. You guys will get credit. You, you know I got your back. I'll just give full credit to everybody that answered it today. Okay, so um, let's see. So the chapters that you read had a um, number of references to paving paradise in which we take coastal areas that a lot of people find very desirable. They want to live near these coastal areas. So we create houses um, for them to live in. And to do so, we have to get rid of all of the features that people found desirable about the coast in the first place. Um, so key nursery habitat like marsh and mangroves have been lost to create coastal developments. And this was especially true um, in the 1960s. But since then, there have been some laws that have been formulated to prevent this from happening. Um, so the Coastal Zone Management Act, which was passed in 1972, was a way of balancing conservation of the coasts and also use of the coast by humans. Um, what it essentially did was it left it up to each state to decide how to manage their coastline. Obviously, states with more coastline have a lot more to possibly lose if people misuse it. And so um, most of the participation has been from states that have a lot of coastline. 
Um, and this uh, federal law also provided funds to support the proposed work that would try and try and achieve these goals. Um, there were some things that it required. So any sort of laws made under the Coastal Zone Management Act um, should give priority consideration to water dependent uses. So any sort of people, industries um, that need water to function. So for instance, fishing, you need water to be a fisherman. Um, those people should have access to the shorefront first before just, you know, someone that wants to live near the water. So you got to make sure that your industries are supported. Um, and the laws should shield coastal areas from damage due to overdevelopment. So, um, you know, there can be development near the beach, but you should have some sort of standards, um, some way that you can say enough is enough. And then finally, if people are going to live near the beach, um, you can't just have major catastrophes every time there's a storm. So there needs to be some sort of building codes to minimize damage from storms and flooding. So increasingly, even though um, real estate has focused on giving everyone that um, ocean view, home buyers have become smart and have started to realize that buying a home that's not going to be flooded every year is probably a better investment. So they're increasingly asking the questions like, how far back is this house from the waterline? And um, is it going to be destroyed by the next storm? So what protections are in place to prevent damage from storms? All right. So um, this last example I have for you is about water management. So we're moving away from, yeah, good guest lectures, except they're trying to give a lecture on other topics today, like tearing up the house. So we've talked about what can be done in terms of multiple users along a coastline um, and some, some laws that have been formed that have helped localities kind of decide how to deal with competing interests when it comes to using the coastline. But um, rivers also flow into estuaries and deltas near the coast. And we know that the rivers serve many roles in an estuarine environment. They're a source of fresh water, so they determine estuarine hydrodynamics and how much, um, how salty an estuary is. Um, they provide the estuary with food. They provide the estuary with sediment. So we've learned all these things about an estuarine environment. Rivers are really important to coastal ecosystems, but they're obviously really important to people too. So what happens when you have too many competing interests laying claim to river water? And so um, the example that I have for you next in the next um, in the next activity will show you an example of that. So go ahead and complete California Water Wars. I don't think this one should take you quite as long. So we'll reconvene in eight minutes at 1119 to wrap up. Okay, if you need more time, um, go ahead and take it, but class is almost over, so just wanted to wrap up. Um, poor Delta Smelt. This, this example keeps me up at night, actually, because it was so easy to lose this species. And uh, even for an ecologist like me, I find it hard to justify um, keeping this species around, given the extreme sacrifice that farmers and people in California would have to make to do so. But who's to say that I'll feel that way when, you know, salmon are on the chopping block or when whales are on the chopping block or it's just kind of a slippery slope, I guess. Um, so anyways, there are a variety of factors that have led to the decline and ultimately um, will lead to the extinction of this species. Um, of those factors, water use are the main ones, so um, drought and over, um, over diversion of the water resources that have led to extreme drought conditions over a long period of time on the coastline. The water that would normally go to feed the delta has been um, largely used up. And then there's also the case of pollution and the article also mentioned invasive species that have um, done a number on this fish. Um, so not all water that is not used by humans um, is a waste. So, for instance, we need water to, to um, feed our estuaries. So some water making it to the coastline 
is good because otherwise we won't have these productive estuarine environments. Um, however, it's up to us as humans to decide how much of that water making it to the coast is enough and how much is wasteful when the people actually need it. And so this is a case where um, possibly people are using too much and causing damage to the ecosystem. First as seen by the smelt, but probably later seen by a number of organisms that might be wiped out in this, in this system. Um, so anyways, another interesting case of human use of the coast. In this case, not coastal development, but um, overuse of the watershed causing coastal impacts. I am not going to be holding office hours tomorrow. I have an important meeting at 2 o'clock, um, so please don't log on to Zoom at 2 o'clock tomorrow. Um, choose another office hours time. And I will see you on Wednesday, no lecture Wednesday. We're going to be doing in-class working on our final projects. I'll be available for questions and guidance.